So a great friend of mine, his name is Jake Schmidt. Um, he hit me, he goes, Hey, I think this fidget spinner is going to be fantastic. I was like, this what? Uh, he goes, it's, it's three ball bearings around plastic and kids use it to relax. So I was like, all right, here, here's some money. Let's go see what we can do on influencers. And the first thing is talking about influence specifically, you have category pages and then you have personalities category yeah. pages, which is a collection of similar content versus a person, which is all the same content around one person. Right. So there's different strengths. We'll get into like the differences as we move forward, but we leveraged collection pages to show, to, excuse me, to showcase our content. And what it did was it resonated with the right demographic. Um, it was a complete shock to the system. Not many people were leveraging as much. The best people doing it was about mo maybe movement watches and a couple of other like people that were in the game at the time. Love it. All right. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, we are very lucky to have Nick Shackelford with us. I first became aware of Nick uh, through Tim Bird's uh, amazing ad buyers group, uh, where Nick is one of the moderators there, bringing a ton of value. I just saw the post that you made last week asking, you know, quizzing people. I thought that was really cool and it got a huge response. Uh, so I connected with him and I found out a little bit more and he's got a crazy good story as a marketer. Um, coming up through the ranks as a, as a CPA, uh, you know, e-commerce kind of guy. And, and now he's really, I think, on the forefront of influencer marketing, which is a big thing uh, that, that I'm focused on this year and a big, 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 I'm really interested in the way it intersects with both affiliate and e-commerce. Uh, and I think it's going to be a, a really good talk. So welcome to the podcast today, Nick. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much. I just got done telling you half of my day was spent in a car. So I'm just really happy to kind of spread out. I got my coffee, like no issues. Like I'm really, really happy where we are right now. Yeah. That's so that's just the LA thing. Like, uh, I know that from the SNL skit where, the, where they all get like, the Californians and they just get together to talk about something and then they always just end up talking about how they got there. <laughs> Different it's highways. True. We have conversations. I think other Californians can relate. I can talk to you about freeways alone and you're going to be like, oh, I get it. 55 to the 22, 22 to the 405. And then like, yep, shouldn't have taken that route. But they understand. <laughs> they get it. It's weird. It's amazing how much better the state is going to do when self-driving cars come in and everyone, well, the thing is, I'm sure lots of people are working during all of this anyway. I'm sure a lot of people are on, I've seen, you know, those reality shows that people are on their phones like motherfuckers during this time, I bet. Oh my God. Yes. I mean, even I'm guilty. The only time that I'm not on my phone is when I have the girlfriend in my car and she's smacking the door. She's like, you're going to kill us both. I'm like, you just do that to yourself. I'm like, okay, I got it. Relax. So That's I have, I'm, it's a bad habit. We got to put our phones down. It's definitely something that we need to work on moving forward, but maybe he gets the tunnel. Maybe uh, he, we do get the tunnel in play. So that commute, that commute will be a lot better. Um, I'm not opposed to using the train. It's just, yeah. it's very efficient at this time. Maybe it gets worse. There's no tunnel, but everyone has flamethrowers and then it becomes a real Mad Max type scenario as we were talking about. Self-driving cars, flamethrowers in a tunnel. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. LA, here we go. Post-apocalypse ready to roll. Nice. Well, oh. I love jumping into it with utter randomness, but why don't we go now and uh, tell us the story a little bit that you told me about how you got into this space and uh, your marketer's journey, basically. Okay, I love it. So I started out on the, the big the big social side, talking about organic play with the likes of Pepsi. Um, that was really more education around how do brands connect with millennials? Since I'm a true 90s kid, how are brands leveraging this organic reach of Instagram and digital and telling stories to drive input traffic and it was really hard to explain what you and I live, right? Like we're in it all day, every day to um, older thinking marketers of mail-ins and banners and billboards. They, un they don't understand the value of like, wait, you can track people who look at things that I show them. All these metrics, they didn't really understand how to, it made sense. And it felt like I was reiterating myself over and over and over into like these big companies that they should, they have enough dollars to invest in the learning but they're just not implying, like implementing any of it. So it was really frustrating to continue down that path. Um, I great opportunity to get in, get my feet wet. Obviously, my my past history before that was playing professional soccer. So I let I leveraged relationships into that Pepsi role. After Pepsi, I, I landed my first social gig with uh, the Apple team under a great leader. Her name was Alison Fulleron. She's a great, great leader, and it was basically we were Apple's social team. Everything hubbed out of LA. They're the marketing agency of record was uh, Mal Media Arts Lab. And we stood there and we were in charge of whether it's Latam, whether it's EU, whether it's like the, the Asian markets. We we're all about 
launching the iPhone 7, as well as um, doing the, the iPad the iPad Pro, which is a launch we did. But there wasn't much strategy in terms of like where we're putting it, other than like the sequences of content, because we had to marry our content to what was going on billboards or what was going on to um, our TV at the time. And so I sat there, I was like, I love it. Taught me Facebook. Uh, I understood how to pull the right levers, like what are the targeting abilities at the highest level for one of the most legitimate brands there are, Apple, respectively, right? And I realized, I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not impacting their bottom line. I'm not impacting their top line. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm playing brand, right? And it's great. There's a huge importance for that. But I want to be closer to the numbers. I want to understand my buttons that I'm clicking right now are actually going to drive revenue in a day to two days to three days. So a great friend of mine, his name is Jake Schmidt. Um, he hit me, he goes, Hey, I think this fidget spinner is going to be fantastic. I was like, this what? Uh, he goes, it's, it's three ball bearings around plastic and kids use it to relax. So I was like, all right, here, here's some money. Let's go see what we can do on influencers. And the first thing is talking about influence specifically, you have category pages and then you have personalities category yeah. pages, which is a collection of similar content versus a person, which is all the same content around one person, right? So there's different strengths. We'll get into like the differences as we move forward, but we leverage collection pages to show, to, excuse me, to showcase our content. And what it did was it resonated with the right demographic. Um, it was a complete shock to the system. Not many people were leveraging as much. The best people doing was about mo maybe movement watches and a couple of other like people that were in the game at the time. And yet, and, what year was this? This was like not too long ago. This is 2015, 2016. This is 2016. The trend was 2016. 2016. 2016. So this, yeah, that's right. Right around this time, around Chinese New Year, which is definitely something that we were first time, Jake and I's first time going through. That's if you don't know how to navigate Chinese New Year, you are as good as dead in the water, man. That is the biggest lesson I could take away. But yeah. what, we, what we learned was that traffic at the top of the funnel, or even at the bottom of the funnel, all we did was influencer traffic was so, yes, hard to measure, but easy to see like the immediate impact because when things took off, things would really take off. And we were talking, we were doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in about one month, two months. At that point, I was like, I, I'm pretty good at this Facebook thing. Let's see what we can do there. So we leveraged all that content we had shooting with influencers, which is another benefit of leveraging influencers and ran that on Insta, uh, ran that both as paid media on Instagram as well as paid media on Facebook, which as you know, we were back in the day or back in the day was last year. Um, that's how things change so fast on Facebook. Back in I the know, day. I know. <laughs> Back in the day, those were like $2 conversions, $4 conversions. And I remember when I sat with Tim, um, when I, I asked you, I actually said, like, I want to work for you. This is down the line. I pulled up my ad account and I showed him fidgetly and he looked at me and he was like, okay, you kind of do know what you're doing, right? He was trying to like get my chops and he, as he went through my ad account, he was like, okay, you get naming conventions, you understand like scaling strategies, like I can, I can groom you if you will. So it was really exciting um, how we leveraged influencers at the beginning with a brand like fidgetly. Yeah, that is that is super interesting. So when you and you you worked out like, did you work out a CPA, you know, uh, sort of with those influencers just based on what you paid them, like on a spreadsheet somewhere? Or were you just seeing, oh, God, we paid them 500 bucks and they made 5000 bucks and, you know, just keep doing this? Yeah, it was. I wish it was more strategic. I really do wish it was like what we could get in impressions wise. Like, I think now when we think that we were measuring the, the follower, we're measuring the follower rate as well as what our purchases were, right? Because we knew if we can get purchases immediately, they're still going to get incremental followers. But if we were just getting followers, then we it's almost like acquiring an email list. Like yeah. we knew coming to our page, cool. So now we can market to them at that point. Maybe we're getting organic sales without having to spend dollars on influencers. Do did we I think your question was did we burn money that we didn't know where it was going? For sure. Yeah. I mean, we we needed to know if this influencer was actually going to drive traffic. And at that time, unless you're paying for a really large service that's tracking influencer movement, you're really just gunning it, even if we're doing some UTM codes in the LinkedIn bio, right? Yeah. And were there some, like, what were the, for this particular uh, product, for, for fidget spinners, what were the, the sort of categories of influencers that worked? Did you find that some totally didn't? Oh, yeah. So we, we actually went down three routes. One, we went to... So our demographic, right? Thinking about the demographic that everybody needs to do for actually who who do we go for influencers is our demographic was 13 to 20, right? Kids in high school or kids in high school, kids in elementary school. That's who we wanted. So like, okay, where are they going? At the time, what was really big then was slime, right? So slime, these kids pulling putty and putting fingers into it. I'm like, okay, 
I don't get it. <laughs> I don't kind of do. I had we had slime. We had some slime as a '90s kid. You had some. You got slimed. Oh, I had I had uh, Play-Doh. Gak. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yes, you're right. So yes, Nickelodeon definitely reared its ugly head again. But yeah. what we were trying to understand is okay, what what is it about the actual slime that they loved? And we came to Jake and I came to the conclusion of satisfying videos. The fact that they're pulling and pushing and watching it go through hands was like, okay, what is at the core? Why are they watching this? So we found more things that would fall into the satisfying videos or like massive compression and breaking iPhones, putting yep. iPads in blenders. These really are weird. Blend. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we would blend. So we were looking at these pages and like, okay, these got hundreds of thousands, even millions of likes and follows. We need to get our product out there because the fidget spinner, one of the biggest draw was it was very satisfying watching it spin around, right? So like, okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, but with that being said, like that, those pages were using our content and Jake was like, dude, we need content made for us. Like we need to start shipping our product so that people can make content. So our biggest one, which actually had no relation to, to our product at all, but he did such great content was actually, he's a bodybuilder. I forgot his name. I would have to pull up on Instagram right now, but he did a, a wall sit with how long can I wall sit while the fidget spinner spun and it. When we posted this video, it just went absolutely viral. And I can not explain to you why, because this man is literally sitting on a wall with a fidget spinner in his hand. So it, it, yeah. at the time, it didn't make sense. As us as marketers were trying to like dig into like, wait, the why, why is this working? Whereas me and Jake were like, I don't really care. Like, let's go find more things like this and to keep it, keep like parrying into our wins, right? Yeah. And you'd, at this point, there weren't really influencer. Were, were you getting these people through influencer networks or were you just contacting them directly? directly because as you as you know if you go through influencer networks like niche which is an influencer driven platform that twitter owns and i mean there's a bunch of them there's a couple more that we could ramble off here but you're paying the middleman fee yeah right so you're paying a middleman fee and they're using some sort of algorithm and some sort of in-house device to understand like what their engagement rate is like all these things that they're going to come to us me as a marketer or me as me as the brand and they're going to sell me on it and at the end of the day i'd rather move quick and I need to find out quick. So I don't want to burn those dollars. I'd rather spend dollars on influencers that I feel might do well with the connection that I made with them for two reasons. One, if I find out real quick, it works, I can negotiate a better deal. And if it find out real quick and it doesn't work, that's fine. I can move on quicker. Whereas I don't want to spend money on waiting for feedback, pay a middleman, all these other incremental fees that you don't need to pay. Yeah. Do you think, so one of the things I'm interested in is how it's changed the influencer game has changed from when you got, when you started with that strategy to what you'd have to do now if you were launching the same strategy. Would the same thing essentially work? Uh, if you had a good product, you could contact all these people directly. You could just do all this manual research and, and, and contact people. Or has it evolved to the point where there has to be sort of more advanced strategies to make something like that work? I think you're absolutely you're right. It, it had to evolve because of the changes that platforms are making. And we had to get smarter. Like we we at the time we were making enough money to where we could be a little little naive to where the dollars were going. But nowadays, if I'm working with a brand specifically, so we do this a lot, very, very often is we need data to understand if I need to put more dollars in it or if I need to cut it quick, right? Because a lot of these brands are short on dollars. Of course, everybody's short on dollars. So if I were to use the strategy again, I would have to break it up into three different buckets. One, a brand awareness play. Two, val social validation. And three, remarketing content with actual physical product in hand. So knowing that like, okay, I can allocate X amount of dollars for just brand awareness. That's going to do two different things. One, grow my following and two, get me content, right? I need that content. That's all day. So we can, yeah. we can yeah. do that or, okay, not, or more. It's like, as soon as you get that content, what do you do with it? Right. And I think the question of like, how would it evolve? So at the brand awareness play, I'm just looking for content and looking for eyes on my brand at the prospecting level where I'm like, I need to go find new customers that potentially might buy. What we like to do is we like to get access or get advertiser access to their Facebook page. A lot of brands aren't doing this or leveraging this because a it's a lot of groundwork, it's a lot of negotiating, it's a lot of like, do you trust me, a influencer B brand enough to give me access to your page? Now this happens. This is really easy in the in, in the advertising world where you go, here's my NDA, here's what we're saying, you approve, do you not approve? We'll change it. And how we're getting around all these, like as you know, like. Facebook smacking down all these brands that don't respect um, the customer journey, right? If you're just running, if you're the dropshippers, for instance, if you're just running bad customer support, 
from your Facebook page, you're going to get affected when everyone's talking about it. Your customer success score is going to get down, 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 which means you don't get more reach, which means to get the, the reach you had before, you have to pay double. Right? So there's this really weird domino effect of negativity, whereas if you leverage an influencer's page, your brand is no longer associated with it unless it's the content, unless they're being it unless they're seeing it in the content itself. Gotcha. So we're so saying we're using uh, it's a marketing product. Eric, I need your Facebook page. I need to run ads about my product with you speaking to it, to your audience already who loves you. And then I'm going to put my paid media dollars behind it, get all the learning, get all the data and understand how great you can convert. Yeah. And, and, and so what happens there in terms of, because it doesn't, then you can choose to put a button on it or not make it look, you could, you could make it look like an ad, but I imagine the more organic it looks, the better. Is there still an icon that goes over top of it? Is there like a handshake thing or something that goes over top of it now that sort of lets people know that it is a sponsored posting? Well, in terms of like when you put brand dollars, it's going it, to say sponsor, like, cause we're, we're pushing it as a paid. So, yeah. so good question. Your question was how do the customers know that it's paid for? Yeah. Right. But how do the consumers know? It's still going to look at the same normal ad you get, which is sponsored in the corner. Yeah. It's going to do, but instead of it saying like marketers 101, it's going to say like Eric. Yeah. It's going to be coming right from your page. And me looking at that, I'm like, I'm already making the assumption of like, I'm expecting a brand, but I'm not seeing a brand. It's a real person. I can click on see who this person really is. Yep. Wow. They really care enough. And they're going to run that ad. And the disc, the, the connection is it's not the brand telling you about it. It's someone else talking about the brand still as an advertiser and we're getting great learnings from it. Yeah. It's, it's really, and I really love this strategy of, of, yeah, basically putting, because that's what Facebook wants. The, the Facebook and Instagram want, they want to diminish people's organic natural reach, uh, yep. where it's sort of wherever possible and they want you to pay for it essentially. So this, this sort of partnering with an agency to drive organic content seems like a really, a really smart strategy. My friend Van, who I just, I did a podcast with last week was telling me about, you kind of wish we had waited a little bit because he had just put this strategy into effect where essentially he went out and got a bunch of influencers to share a post on Facebook that they had made, that their brand had made. And essentially it was like a, which of these trucks is more badass kind of brand. So you need to have something that requires engagement. You then get all these influencers to share that post, building up a huge organic machine of like engagement and, and commentary. And then you use that as your like audience, essentially as your audience engine. And then you retarget on both Instagram and, uh, you know, and, and then you get the influencers to, to do a post. He said they made 60K just off the swipe ups, just wow. off the swipe ups in uh, on Instagram stories, uh, which I think is really, really interesting. That's so powerful because he's basically leveraging social proof the right way. Like that is that's not like sneaky. That's not like, ha ha, got you. That's like, I understand what the platform is telling me. The platform is telling me you need to have better organic engagement or else you're not going to get any love for it. So yeah. he went out, yeah. did that route. God, that's genius. That's really good. Yeah, he's a super smart guy. And I think, and this is the, and I think this is why performance, this is why I'm so interested in influencer marketing this year specifically, because I feel like there are a lot of, there's, it's a young space. It's such a young space compared to some other ones. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a lot of room for, uh, you know, for performance marketers to come in and understand it, grasp it, leverage it in new ways potentially as well. For sure. Um, What's your, are you, I just got into just, just with our brand, I've just started doing the stories, the Instagram stories. I'm trying to get on a story schedule here. I'm, I'm, I, I'm struggling for content. What, you, what's your personal stance on like social media? So do you, do, do you personally do a lot of stories? Me personally? No, because I think when you ask these questions to performers marketers who spend their entire life on Facebook, on platform, it's so different. Cause I look at it. I don't look at it as a social tool anymore. I look at my Instagram. I look at my Facebook. I look at everything as a, as a lead gen format, right? Like yeah. I am showing them my best work. I am showing everyone like, this is what I'm capable of doing. So I, if, unless it's something to highlight that's half, that's pretty cool. Or it's something with my, me and my girl, me and my family, it's really hard for me to like post that on stories where if you're, if your entire business is the content that you're pushing, which makes sense where you're at. Yeah. That, that content strategy is absolutely genius. And I think there's a perfect strategy between organic and ga organic posts and shares versus like your paid. So, Paid social, like those need to definitely marry together. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can t we can talk after. We can do some uh, some consulting because we're just really this year going to be putting in a big heavy focus on growing our audience. We have this a great great kernel of you know of this audience, but we really want to find ways to broaden it essentially uh, right. in all that we're doing. So it'd be cool to chat about that. Oh, all day. I love this stuff. You know that.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super cool. What was that? so uh, back to your, your you had mentioned that you were a goalie for the LA Galaxy, and is that, so that's how you got into into influencer marketing. What was the first product that you pushed? So this is, <laughs> oh man. Okay, so when we were with, when we, when I was with the Galaxy, I knew I was like, I want sponsors. Like, I want goalie gloves. I want cleats. I want all these things. So like, how can I position myself as an influencer? Like I did at, at, at my peak, I was maybe like 25,000 followers on Instagram. Pretty stoked, like organically driven, organically driven. And it actually happened in a very weird roundabout way. So when I was growing, when I was growing my page, I actually had like a bigger beard than this, much bigger beard, really long hair, and a, a page called Man Bun Monday. Of, <laughs> I swear to you, Derek, I swear. <laughs> A bunch of like men with man buns and beards got posted. And I actually woke up and I woke up to a bunch of messages on my Instagram. I was like, whoa, like 50 followers. What is going on? I found out I was posted on a page and I was like, well, they just took my picture and they posted me and I, they tagged me and I just grew followers. I was like, what just happened? Like, I need to do it again. It was like that adrenaline rush of like, I need more. I want more followers. I found another page called Men in Coffee, Men Drinking Coffee. I actually, this was the jumping point. Men in Coffee was featured on Snapchat Cosmopolitan, Snapchat's Cosmopolitan page. Okay. The, the day that they posted my picture, number one, was the day they got featured. So it went featured on that feature. It got boosted by Snapchat. From Snapchat, I was like, I'm addicted. How do I do yeah. this? How do I do this? So I started reaching out. I know. And I was all. it's all vanity, right? It's all like I want to see like how big I can get. And I, didn't, I wasn't smart enough at the time to think, wait, wait, this is – like this needs to be a business. Like athletes are businesses. Like I need to think of this like a business. How do I do this? So I approached um, a goalkeeper brand called Keep Air, which I'm now very a part of. And it's it's a base in Vancouver. So the great guy's name is Dennis. And I asked, I was like, I, I know I have a lot of influencers at that time, other professional goalkeepers, and I can send the product and we can get content, we can get posts. The only strategy we've done for the past four years is seeding product and having them share posts on their page. Wow. So that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't playing professional, understanding the true value of what an influencer is. Everyone's an influencer. It just depends who you're speaking to. It depends on your niche. And that's that's such a really, like, that's crazy. There's a company in Vancouver thriving on this network of goalies that you kind of put together. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And that can happen in, you know, that's that's what, you know, this space is just so interesting. It's just in, infinitely dividable. So what I'm interested in is also, like, what do you recommend? So there's two sides of it, right? There's to the brands who are trying to, to leverage influencers, there's the people who want to become influencers. So, to my audience, who are sort of affiliate marketers, and let's say let's say e-commerce, like like early stage e-commerce people, is there mm -hmm. a fit for them to leverage e-commerce, or do you really want to be focused on building a brand before you would use influencers to build brand equity? Like, is there a pure arbitrage play with influencers at this point, or is it something that you want to be leveraging to build something longer term? That's a that's a that's a massive question. I'm going to try to unpack it as step by step. So the brands, there's one brand that's doing a really great that I'm working with right now. I actually refuse to accept any brand dollars for them because they're so new to the space of female products that I said, you need to seed all of your content and product and you need to be aware that you're going to take a loss, but you need to start hitting up anybody from 5,000 followers to 50,000 followers because we need content. Content, content is king, especially when it's a testimonial because it's more social proof. Think about that content as our entire ad strategy, because if we can get social validation on the actual ads itself, I can build pieces around that all day. I can get yeah. a branded piece, I can get product, et cetera. So I would tell a brand that's new, just starting out, have an understanding of like who you're trying to market to. After I understand, okay, it's girls 13 to 20, perfect. Okay, what are they What are they looking at on Instagram? I would start, because Instagram's the youngest demographic, I'd probably go there first. I would see, start searching the hashtags of if it's female products, I would do like makeup tutorials, makeup artists. Start so just trying to get an understanding of what's ranking for them and what they're actually enjoying. This route would be going towards more of a themed page, but that's still going to give you an understanding of like, okay, who are the big players in this space? Because this influencer strategy of understanding, okay, who's my demographic? Who are they engaging with? What are the biggest pages? Do I need to reach out to those pages and see if they make content? Or do I need to reach out to them and see if they will just share my content? Yeah. But in yeah. the background, everything that's running is I've already seeded my product to all these girls and these girls are making content for me, whether they're influencers or not. They might influence five people. You know, they might be a real, like some girl that has 
250 friends, but she might be the cutest one out of everyone. And now she's influencing all of her girlfriends, right? So the, the scheme of what an influencer is, is not based upon the numbers that they have, but it's more based upon the actual influence that they're able to, to portray. That's really interesting. Yeah. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of, of influencers that have sort of lazy followings or just, you know, that, that have gotten so big, they don't actually really cater that audience. And maybe they're just looking because they look good in a ba- bathing suit or something, right? Like there's probably, it's all about the engagement of your following. Yes, definitely. And so that's why I think the, one of the questions you asked me was, well, does the brand need to go get a million followers? Does, do I need to go hire Kylie? Like, do I need to pay Kylie for, for her face? It's like not necessarily because yeah, she does have massive influence, but the wrong influencer is going to be more detrimental than, than anything. Like if you're going to choose someone just because based on the, how much following they have, that could do the complete opposite effect and really upset the people that care about who your brand yeah. is. Like I may never drink a Pepsi again. Thanks to Kylie. It, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it, I can't, I can't sit here and go, you know, what? yeah, you definitely need 2 million, 2 million uh, following influencers to really boost your brand. Whereas, no, like you have to start small. You have to be realistic of what your goals are and who's actually closest to your brand. Now, if you have an opportunity to get Kylie to post for a reasonable price, I'd probably really look at it. Doesn't make sense for sure. I would look at it, but if it's not, it's it's not not break. It's not gonna it's not gonna hurt you that bad, right? Yeah. And so, okay, so focusing on the on the brand, then if you're a brand looking to get into into this. Uh, reach out, to, you know, know your customer persona, reach out to people who, you know, have any level of following Nessus, maybe, you know, uh, b- basically that can, can portray your message with some influence basically, and then look for a lift, basically look for a lift after that. Once, once that goes out for sure, because there's a lot of strategies where you can just go really blanketed effect where a lot of low followers, but a lot of content, right? And then we'll see, okay, let's push it out and see like on this day we're launching, let's see what the lift is going to be. And then you can split test that against someone who has one or two people that have massive followings. And then you can see the difference of traffic, right? You can try to control as many variables as possible, but you can start seeing the trends of like, okay, all these girls posting at these times, lower traffic, uh, lower followers, but then together it was great traffic versus these select massive following, not as good traffic, vice versa, right? Different ways. But that's just... Sorry, go ahead. That's just only looking at it on Instagram, right? Like the thing that we are looking to leverage is themed pages, but on Facebook, the opportunity on Facebook is so much bigger because you can put real dollars behind it or, or not that much dollars behind it and get understandings immediately based upon that post on their page. Let it sit. It's going to acquire its organic love. And then you put your media dollars behind it. It's just going to look so much more organic. And I just went through this with uh, a pet niche brand, right? We just went through leveraging the page. I love dogs. Obviously those people who love those, that page is loves dogs. So I'm going to leverage that as much as possible. And it was, I've never seen a return like this. Yes. We put good ad dollars behind it. So we had really good learnings, but that relationship is so strong now that we are going to go back to them any single time we have a dog product to launch. Interesting. What, here's a, here's a technical, what, what happens with the audiences? Do those stay siloed when you work from client to client in the influencer space? Or is there an agreement to be able to share like, yeah, because it's always, it's, you don't want to share email lists. You never, people are never sharing email lists, but I'm wondering when it comes to like building an, an audience, does that, how does that work? That's a great question. I, I think as an agency, I would have to ask, it's more of a permission thing because yeah, yeah. I use it as like, that's my secret weapon. Is that like my secret audience? I, it gets kind of touchy there. Like audiences go down to like importing a customer list and getting a lookalike. Now that lookalike might be very strong. I don't technically think I can share that with a similar brand. Yeah. Now, to me, I don't think it's an issue because it's an audience that might resonate better or worse with a different product, right? It's case by case. So I really think it's it's like, oh, I'm going to try this. If it doesn't work, what are my expectations? And it's never exclusive either. Like just because one is showing doesn't mean the other one wouldn't necessarily. So it's not like uh, it's it's yeah, and, and it's in a feed that's always changing. And always yeah, refreshing. Exactly. So I don't, I don't see it as being as much of an issue as, as say an email address, I, for instance. I agree. I don't think it's, you're not like taking anything proprietary. You're not owning something. I'm yeah. sure people would argue about that. So we'll, we'll definitely hear about it in the comments. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so what about, what about people running e-commerce stores and things like, and things like at what point in an e-commerce person's journey, should they be thinking about, about influencers and their role in, in driving their business? Oh, I think it, immediately, right? It's as you're developing the brand and you're developing, cause you're going to say like, here's my brand book. Here's what we stand for. 
in that same discussion, you're going to find out, okay, here's my influencers that, that stand for what I stand for, right? So then you're developing early the uh, touch points of how you want your customer journey to be, whether you're showing something at the top of the funnel that's very brand awareness. I don't really, like, I just want to introduce you. And then you're going to back it up with some more social proof with an influencer respected in that industry that you're selling in with your product. Maybe that's a little more push for them to make that purchase. And then we follow up again with a normal, regular human being using the product as well. So there's different steps in the journey that I would let, like levers I would pull as they're moving down my funnel. Every single brand, let's put it this way. Every single brand knows they need influencers. You, you have to, right? But then every single brand doesn't know necessarily at what point of the funnel or what point of the customer journey do I need to plug them in at. And that, yeah. and, right? Yeah, yeah, I see that. Now, and, and but it, I think a large portion of our audience too doesn't think about brand in the same way too, you know? Like I think a lot of the guys from the, you know, the, the Tan Brothers school of, of e-commerce, which is just like test 10 products a day, find what works. Like, is there an opportunity to do, like, is there a reason to create brands around stores rather than around products? I don't, I don't think so, eh? Like, there's not a lot of loyalty to, to guys' gadgets or whatever. There may be loyalties to specific products that end up building their own brand, but, other, but to the people playing the store game, there maybe isn't as much of a place for, for influencer, or, or I could be wrong. No, no, I don't think you're wrong at all. I think it comes down to what their goals are. Like, as everybody knows, this is a hot topic that people are getting banned. Dropshippers are getting bad experiences. Bad experiences are losing their stores. I'm having to rebrand a couple of stores already because I can't get, I can't get the same reach. Nothing's different except Facebook smacked me real quick. Um, so what I would argue is as a dropshipper, we understand that you know you you just want money. Um, unfortunately, like maybe you are trying to grow a really nice brand. At the end of the day, you're not taking inventory. You're not super married to the business. If something changes, you're going to hop on that new product. No problem. Totally understand. But in the back of your mind, you need to understand that, that that's not going to be there forever. Like We're very spoiled as businesses. I posted about this earlier. We're spoiled because we're able to put ads up and make revenue as soon as possible. But that's that's going to go away and telling a full story, building a store. Now, I'm not saying take on inventory. I'm saying if you're going to be a drop shipper, put some effort into getting a brand around it so that people can actually feel like, OK, this is something real. Like I am. In, I, I want to be a part of this brand. I want to grow with this brand. I want to stay with this brand because I work with both ends. I work with the drop shippers that want to smash and I work with brands that are trying to build. If the brands are trying to build are going to win long run because they're committed to it. They're already like, I understand I'm in this for one, two, three years. Whereas my drop shipping clients are going, man, Q4 was unbelievable. What happened in Q1? What are we going to do? I'm like, I don't know. Chinese New Year clothes. What do you want me to do? You want me to turn ads on? Yeah, exactly. That'll sink your business in a heartbeat as you, as you, you, know, you can find out. So your main question, sorry, I danced around it was as it, as from the, the people coming from the Tan School of business, of, I'm, I'm testing, testing, testing. You don't have time to get an influencer unless you have an influencer in your pocket and you have the product and she's doing it for multiple products. There's no way you're going to be able to find it. There's no way, there's no way you're going to be able to get a consistent like path to like, okay, product to influencer, influencer add up. They don't, they don't want to wait that long. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the process of finding the right influencers and all that. Yeah. It's just not going to work. It's, it's just such an interesting time for me. Cause I know you spoke about it really well there about, about the algorithm changes and the, you know, the news, the, the news feed changes essentially and how it's, it's harder and harder to, to find that audience. Uh, over and over again. And, and the other fact that I've heard of a lot lately is it, you need to start realizing that you may not make money on your first purchase. You know, you may not, you have, you're going to have to pay so much to acquire consumers that you're not going to make money on that first purchase. So if you don't have a good consumer experience or a brand where they want to come back to you and be a part of it again in the future, like long term, even within the next like three, six months, it might not work. <laughs> Eric, this conversation, brother, has been the biggest pain in my butt. I am having this left around like, Okay, so it's an equation. It's an equation we talk about it all the time. It's it's customers conversion rate average order value. Like I've been taught this by his name is Taylor Holiday. He's ingrained this in me. It's always a pendulum. You're always trying to make sure what's what's going to make more sense. If I can acquire a customer cheap, if they can convert high, and I can get a high AOV, you're going to win. Yep. AOV in that bucket itself is LTV. So if you're not working on your LTV and you're getting repurchasers or you're communicating with them effectively. You're going to be consistently trying to acquire a customer as cheap as cheap as possible. So if you're trying to acquire them very cheap, that's not going to stay cheap. But you're going to start smashing audiences, and it's going to get expensive. 
So you need to think about as a brand owner, okay, my AOV is 20 bucks. What can I pay on platform? Not, not thinking about my cogs. I can probably pay worst case to make a, my money back $10, $15, worst, worst, worst case. That You're not going to win that way. If you're going CPA route, you need to be able to work on how does that back out? How am I making this customer spend more dollars with me in the long run? Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. And that's what I'm really interested to see the way, uh, because the people that do those stores play that store smashing game aren't always the ones thinking about about a brand. And, and it's, it's a very different mindset. And, and then especially once you bring influencers into it, where these guys are used to putting a dollar in and getting two dollars out uh, mm -hmm. and have it be done with a few clicks, you know, a few strokes of a key. Now, if you've got to go and build a brand and you've got to seed content and build your brand equity and all these things that are not as instantly recognizable, I feel like the, the, the winners are the ones that are going to to, to recognize this and, and, you know, the pendulum swing swings back into this sort of brand space as well as long as well with the hardcore performance in this new environment. It's going to be interesting to see. For sure. I mean, we I'm, I'm very blessed to have a good relationship with Facebook and to have clients that have good relationship with Facebook and they are feeding them understanding of like, hey, work on the journey, work on the customer journey, work on like what they're seeing. How is your customer support? Are you responding to comments on your ads? That's the biggest driver because people forget that your relevancy score is based upon how great your engagement is as well as like your impressions, whatever the equation is. But if you're pushing ads and you're not as a brand, you're not responding to anybody on that ad, it's not going to do well because it's going to, Facebook's going to see that you're not responding. You're not listening. You don't care. Yeah. That's a whole nother thing to do. And if you're not going to spend the time to invest into like getting an influencer to speak highly of your brand, you're certainly not going to invest in taking care of like those ads that you have run. Yeah. Have you seen, so with these newsfeed changes, have you seen much of a change in the industry in 2018, like in your industry, in, in the influencer game? Have you seen, how has that impacted? Has that made, are people more likely to listen to those trusted voices? Are, the, are those voices that are influential uh, still getting a solid share of the newsfeed? Or is it just meant that you've had to put more do paid dollars behind behind organic stuff? I think it's the, the what you just said right there, the more paid dollars behind the organic stuff. We see, I talk to a client every day. She, she's in the baby niche and she posts on her organic page. She goes, I used to get hundreds and hundreds of likes and comments and I'm not doing anything. If I don't boost it, I'm not getting anything out of my organic page posts. And I'm like, well, okay, let's put some dollars behind it. As soon as you put the dollars behind it, we're getting revenue. That's, yeah. And it's very, to me, it's, it's, it's shocking because she's a real brand and she's a real business and she's, she's sharing real content that people love. But now she's really paying for it for, for not her fault. Like she is a good brand. She's real. And all these other people that are posting, I'd say like memes and just trying to get engagement for things that are tricking or like duping you into comments so that I can smash you with an offer. It's really affecting all the real brands out here. Hmm. Interesting landscape. So what is, how much is like, you're sort of 50, 50 in both these worlds now at this point with the drop shippers and the, and Tim's group, like, are you still run campaigns on the side and stuff? Or are you more focused on the, on the influencer game now? No, it's, it's definitely the core of it's in Facebook. It has to be in Facebook because that's where all the dollars are going and selling influencer, selling just plain influencer work is really hard because you have to track it from the beginning to the end. You have to report back on like, this specific influencer was able to drive X dollars for you. There's too many attribution models to follow. And at the end of the day, I'm probably going to be able to remarket to them anyways on Facebook. Yeah. So influencer is a piece of the pie in the whole scheme of Facebook pie. If I, gotcha. if I have any words, because the, the dollars are going to be all spent on Facebook. I'm, it's just where we're at right now. Nice. Are you going to be attending uh, traffic and conversion summit in San Diego? Oh yeah. I love nice. it. I think we, we have definitely a, have to meet up there. We will. I think we will. Nice. There's a big STM meetup happening uh, before the show, so I'll make sure you get an invite to that. Oh, uh, please. It'd be, be fun to hang out in person, have a few drinks. I would love that. Are you, when are you, what day do you fly in? I'll be on, in on the, uh, I'm not sure yet. I'll, 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 we'll connect offline. Definitely. But uh, I want to, so if people want to get in touch with you, they want to know more about Nick, they, got, they can find you on the Ad Buyers group, uh, posting hot, hot content all the time. Uh, oh. And then uh, it's structured, so structured-social.com if you want to talk to Nick about uh, some some strat brand strategies or, or uh, Facebook strategies. I'm sure he's always game to talk. Any other ways to get a hold of you? I mean, Instagram, you can DM me. Just go back in the old days. Slide into my DMs. I'll respond. Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much. I know you got a big call coming up, so I'll have to catch up about how that goes. 
Yes. And uh, have, have, a, have a good one, man. Good chatting. Eric, I love it. Thank you so much, man. Bye.